for him. And he tells me he has a personal problem, and he went to many, many counselors, and nobody could help him. And his Jewish colleagues in the Senate said there's one great rabbi that he usually has very good advice. So I made an appointment to him. He comes down, and after he comes down, he came out of the rabbi, so he was very emotional. Well, that I've been accustomed to, and whoever comes down to the rabbi would be emotional. Well, how come a non Jewish person, what would he find in the rabbi that made him feel that way? So I told him, Mr. Sunder, I'm going ask, asking you the personal thing, but something I see touched you. Could you tell me what it was? He said, I'll tell you very simple. He says, I have a family problem, which became very, very serious, and I didn't know what to do. We went to seek advice and nothing helped. As I said, well, his colleagues told him, go to Rabbi Schneerson, and I have to tell you, he said, I want to thank them, because the rabbi gave me the most best advice that you can think of, and I'm sure that with this approach, this problem will be solved. I was finished. I picked myself up. I was about to exit and come out. And the rabbi tells me, Mr. Sonner, for one minute, you came here to ask me questions, and I had to answer you. I want you to sit down, because I'm going to ask you a question, and I hope I get an answer from you. And he tells me, I couldn't understand that. The whole world turns to the Rebbe for answers because he's supposed to have all the answers. He's going to ask me something which he doesn't know. How could that possibly be? Yeah, but you know, the Rabbi said so. I sat down, and the Rebbe tells me as follows. In Manhattan, there's a section called Chinatown. And just recently, he found out that these people are being deprived of certain programs that they could benefit to make the quality of life much better. There could be programs from Washington, from Albany, which is the capital of New York State, and from the municipality of New York. I'm asking you, Mr. Senator, being that they're your constituents, that you should get your staff together. They should try to inquire which are the programs that could be applied to these people in China. And then I said, you should know, Chinese people basically are very quiet. They don't make a lot of noise. And they'll suffer. Even if they have to suffer, they'll be quiet. And if we could help them, why shouldn't we help them? And the candidate looks at me, so I want to know why I'm Dutch. I don't believe that there's one Chinaman who's known Rabbi Schneerson. And I don't think Rabbi Schneerson knows one Chinaman. But it seems to me that it's no difference to the Rebbe who they are, if they know him or not. As soon as he found out that there are a group of people, that their way of life, their quality of life, can be better, and he has an opportunity to help them, at the first opportunity he has, he utilizes this, and that's what he told me to do. So here we see that the Rebbe wanted that the whole world should be a better world. The whole world should be a peaceful, tranquil world. There should be harmony in the whole world. And that was the Rebbe's ambition, and that's what he set out. From the very beginning, when in 1950, the Rebbe assumed his leadership, that was his goal, that was what he had aspired to reach. And this is what the Rebbe did in his entire life, trying to improve the Jewish way of life, the non-Jewish way of life, and to prepare the world for the coming of Mashiach. After hearing this, we have a subject which is called Israel, which we call Eretz Yisrael, Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land. In fact, the name Holy Land was recognized oh, not only by the Jewish world, but the non-Jewish world also. Where does the Holy Land come from? How did it ever start? What happened over here? As we learn the Chumash, we learn when Hashem, the Almighty, told to Avraham Avinu, what he told to Yitzhak Avinu and to Yankov Avinu. And he said that this land I'm designating for your children, to their, for generations to come. This is going to become your land. In the Torah, in the Bible, we have the boundaries of which, what is this land that according to the the Almighty set aside for the Jewish people. Not only did he set aside and set the Jewish people, but there are many halakas, many laws that pertain only to Eretz Yisrael. There's a mitzvah to take mice, and you take a tenth of the produce that you grow, that you have to give away to the priest, to the lady. There are many different things that only in Eretz Yisrael, because Hashem made the land, that the land itself, the earth of the land becomes holy. And that land, the Rebbe Shlisham Hashem said, that this is designated only for the Jewish people. 
And that's why when Moshe led the Jewish people out of Egypt and they were on their way to Israel, the Rebbe said, I'm taking you to this land. After Joshua, when he entered and he took over the land, and this is the land that belongs to the Jewish people. Now, when we say it belongs to the Jewish people, I just want to put, make certain some prefaces before we get into this, this, uh, this problem, peace or peace. When they say it belongs to the Jewish people, we are accustomed that somebody lives in a certain country and becomes a citizen, so he is part of that country. America, Australia, Africa, whatever it is. The land of Israel is different in that respect. The land of Israel that Hashem inherited to every Jew, and it's regardless where that Jew is going to live. A Jew could live in South Africa, he could live in Australia, he could live in America, and according to Halakha, he has a part of Eretz Yisrael that belongs to him. In, he has a, he's a partner in all of Eretz Yisrael, but he also has four cubicles which Hashem gives every Jew, and how we divide is another question, but that is a Halakha. That means that the land of Israel does not only belong to citizens who live in Eretz Yisrael, but according to Halakha, according to where Hashem assigned this, that this belongs to every single Jew, man, woman, old and young, wherever they may not be. Which means to say that there's not one group of people who are the owners of Eretz Yisrael. There's not one group of people who can decide what to do with this entity which is called Eretz Yisrael. It belongs to every Jew. That's number one. Number two, something which the Abishka has assigned specifically and clearly in the Torah. Nobody could come and change that. What do you mean he can't change? Of course we can change it. But there's no validity to that change. There's no basis for that change because if you do something which is contrary to what Hashem said, it doesn't hold water. You can't base yourself on that. That doesn't mean that it's true. It's untrue. Because the only truth is only the Torah. And if the Torah had set up a sign then it has to be such a way, anybody can come and do what he wants, of course. But that doesn't mean that that is going to be that way, that's the way it should be. So therefore, when we have these general, so to say, ideas about Eretz comes now a question. What do we do with Eretz Now let me go back to 1947, 1948. How did we get Israel? We got it from the UN. What do we mean we got it from the UN? The UN decided they're going to take this piece of land and divide it. Part of it could be a state of Israel, and another part could be a state of Palestine. What was the basis of the Jewish people who turned to the UN to demand, request, ask that this part of the land of the world should be given to the Jewish people? So if we take out the records of the UN from 1946-1947, and you read what it says, what Ben Gurion said, what all the other members of that delegation came to the UN said. They took out the Chumash, they took out the Bible, and they said, look what it says in the Bible. That to Abraham it said that this is going to belong to your children to come. To Isaac it said, to Jacob it said, we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore we claim to this land. We claim that this land belongs to us. And based on that, the UN decided that therefore we should give that part. Why did they give the other part to the Palestinians? In order that there should be conflicts, whatever it was. Now, when the UN decided that we should establish the state of Israel, the UN gave this delegation two options. <coughs> One option was that you should be a state without any connection to anyone else. You could have been a member, like Canada, Australia, is part of the Commonwealth of England. What would be the difference? If you would be part of the Commonwealth, the Arab country said, then we have no problem. We'll allow you to have your state, knowing that on top, you have the crown of England. So really, it's not a 100% Jewish state, it belongs to England, so we'll accept it. If you want to be a state on your own, 